Good morning. Welcome to Beyond the Seaf Model. I'm Jack Kosar. This is effective for the week of October 14th, 2024. Let's get started. Seaf signals for this week. We got technology, financials, and industrials. This is a complete flip from last week where we had XLU, XLE, and XLC. Um, as you can see here, our rankings are relatively high. Um, what that tells me is there's not a lot of conviction in any particular time period. Um, as you can see here, technology with a strategic uh, at 11, uh, financials showing a tactical at 10, um, some more recent strength in here, and then rounding that off is industrials at 15 as well, kind of just sitting middling in the pack with all of its scores. Um, broadly, what we're seeing here is a lot of churn going on. Um, and as this money kind of flows through, um, tend to see you know some transitionary periods we continue to be a bit of a transitionary period at the moment as you can see here utilities dropped off score of 11 same thing with energy uh, score of a 10 on the trading week so kind of a abrupt uh, flip heading into our heat map um, is if you guys kind of watch uh, watch me do this often I like to see when the model is really kind of thumping we like to see green sitting all up at the top and we like to see red all up at the bottom. As you can see here, we got a bit of a Picasso painting um, going on. Uh, colors kind of all over the place. The uh, top flow for the week was technology at a 0.43%. Um, relatively strong, that's about the average that we see on a particular trading week. Uh, financials coming in second with a 0.24% per, uh, increase. Um, overall, through all 11 sector spiders, we had a 0.5% increase. The other kind of interesting thing to note here was in general, when we see the money flowing in and out of the 11 sector spiders, uh, we tend to see trending days. So we'll see two, three, four, five days in a row where we see money flowing in and uh, or three, four, five days in a row with money flowing out. For the last about two weeks, every other day, we have a positive flow, negative flow, positive flow, negative flow. That's, again, telling me that managers have a lot of real indecision going on, which is why we're seeing a lot of this money um, kind of flow in and out. Um, next, we're going to move into our technology and uh, bring in Dad to kind of give a, a couple of extra points as to what's going on with these, with these markets. Yeah, you might be wondering why I'm here. This is usually Jack's show. Jack actually has more of a... Um, granular understanding of these data than I do um, and we built a model together I'm here because uh, I've got an interesting question at the teach-in we do a monthly teach-in uh, once a month and I got an interesting question and it was basically you were in technology and then you were out of technology and then the next week or whatever it was the next couple of weeks you were right back in why didn't you just stay there because the CIF model is following the money. We're not forecasting. We're not saying, well, I like technology because I think X is going to win the election or the Fed's going to do this or next year we're going to have better. We don't do any of that stuff. We're following the money. Take a look at this chart. So this is the technology XLK sector and favorite is green on the chart. Neutral is yellow and avoid is red. Take a look at this really um, atypical behavior since, let's call it the middle of August. We Well, let's start at the beginning of August. We were on an avoid, and we ripped up to favored. When, when it goes to favored, that means there's a aggressive acceleration of money that's going into that sector in multiple time periods. There's money charging in there, and it's showing up on a weekly, on a monthly, and on a a quarterly basis and then it was up there for like a New York second and BAM we went right down to avoid and then we went up to favored came back it's all over the place we're not forecasting the reason this model works and we're gonna go over some of the performance here in just a little bit the reason that this model has been so good over time is because we're not forecasting we're not trying to act like we know what the markets gonna do nobody knows that when you see this kind of really erratic behavior the market doesn't know either so all we're doing is following that money so if you see a lot of turnover the model isn't broken what's changed is 
This model is seven or eight years old. This is the most erratic year that we've seen since the inception of the model. Does it mean the model's broken? The model's doing exactly what it should be. It is telling us when the market is interested in going somewhere. Take a look at this. This is in May. Uh, May, we moved into favored status in technology outside of a couple of days that it dropped into neutral territory here, the yellow. It stayed there. Look what happened to XLK. We got this really nice period of relative outperformance down in the lower panel, meaning it's outperforming the S&P. That's what this does. So we stick with this model as long as it stays. Another thing, Jack, uh, we should probably look at is look at the high scores that we had. Normally, if something's really strong, you've got scores of four, five, and six. Our three best scores here are 13, 15, and 15. They're just on the edge of rolling into the neutral category. What does that mean? It means that there's really no trend going on here. The money is herky-jerky. I think what's going on, it doesn't matter if we know why this is happening or not. We don't get any more money out of our trades by knowing what it was. But obviously, we're going into a contentious election that's pretty much dead tied and there's a lot of different economists have come out saying that there's going to be different changes to the economy depending on who gets in and what the policies are that they're going to implement so just something i wanted to point out to you today um, we follow this model because this is an aberration and the norm is the market eventually finds a place it likes and it stays there. So we can do very well in just a short period of time. And in the meantime, we just have to be true to the model. And that's what we're suggesting that you do. All right. Yeah, a couple of more examples of kind of this uh, jerky nature of the, uh, of the asset flows. Here's financials. Financials rips in from a void. Uh, where it had stayed there for a couple of weeks back in uh, last month, now jumping up into favored. As you can see here, we're not yet really getting that. It actually moves fast enough where we're not quite getting that relative our performance that we would normally expect as we head into favored. Now, again, this is just kind of tipping in just a little bit. As another note as to why money could be flowing into XLF without being too speculative, um, it's, this is the first time that the yield curve has not been inverted since 2022. The two tens curve. The two tens curve. So uh, just, you know, one, one reason why we could be seeing money kind of flowing aggressively into financials um, as, we, uh, as we turn over this particular week. Same thing if we look at utilities. As you can see here, we had some nice sustained, when the model is running well, you can tell because we have sustained scores in the favored to upper favored territory. Um, that really gets this nice long relative our performance trends that we can see here. Um, but as, as, as we can see, looking at the chart, money flew out of utilities, extremely strong. As I said, it's actually the worst ranked sector on the trading, uh, trading week for this particular week after having some pretty sustained success over, over a several month time frame. Um, last but not least this week, um, energy, uh, similar thing. We came in from a void. Look, we had this long sustained, little bursts into neutral, but lo pretty long sustained section of being in the avoid ranking, and we've had that long relative our performance trend. So what these things tend to do, what you can see here is when the model is working, when there's conviction from investors in any particular sector, we get these long spurts in per, in certain areas. Um, you know, we got we ran right up for energy, and the money ran right back out, sitting into neutral. Uh, last thing I wanted, oh, during the teach-in last week. Um, I talked about energy. We went through all of the all of the rainbow charts, all of the eleven rainbow charts, and I pointed out that energy had just popped up into favor. We said we don't know if it's going to look like this, which was back in the middle of May, where it gets up there for one or two or three days, and then it drops right back down, and then we had all this relative outperformance. Or if we get up there like we did in middle to later part of February, and then stayed there for two months and gave us a really nice period of outperformance. So we are data driven. We're not forecasting. If this comes out, that means the money got up there. It got nervous for whatever reason. We don't know and we don't care, but the money came out of there. So that's how you read these charts. And that's why they're so important, because you can see historically when the money is going out of there and stays in a void for long periods of time, 
We have long periods of relative outperformance. We don't want to fade this because this can turn into this and we don't want to be sitting there waiting for the sun to come out in energy. The money's leaving there, we're leaving with it. All right, last thing I wanted to highlight here for today's video, this is an internal tool that we use. Um, we call it the industry group table. And what it is is the uh, spider has a, a 22 industry groups that they um, that they track. Sorry, 21 industry groups that they track. Um, the way we use this is to try to understand the left half. Look, the left half side of this table is a similar uh, the similar algorithm that we use to track the velocity of money in CIF and the 11 sector spiders, but apply to the 21 industry groups that spider dictates. What we try to do here is also see, uh, because these are a little bit smaller ETFs, the money, um, the total AUM for each ETF is a little bit lower than that of the sector spiders. They got a little bit more movement on them. So the algorithm, while it does track the money very well, it's not as, uh, the conviction isn't quite there for these smaller ETFs. So we added the right-hand side of this table. What the right-hand side tracks is its relative performance on a week basis versus SPY its relative performance on a weekly basis for its versus its parent sector. So in, in this case, regional banks, KCE, parent sector is going to be XLF or financials. Um, the reason we brought this in today is normally in this very rightmost column, we like to highlight the sectors that are doing, that we've determined are green across the board, more or less. So they have to have a green score, which means on the, uh, asset flow side, which means money is flowing into these particular ETFs. We want to see a positive change in score from last week. Um, as we can see a little bit in our rainbow charts, as money flows from avoid to neutral into favored, we start to pick up some relative our performance um, as it's making that move. So as a part of this table, I want to see some positive movement in terms of its scoring to, to show me that you know money isn't just sitting up top, but it's actually, it's showing that velocity over several time periods. So this is the score from last week. Again, the reason I'm bringing this up is this is the first time since I have run this table for the past year that I have not had green across the board where we're not outperforming SPY, uh, outperforming the parent sector, have a positive move in the Any of change from last week's score and also green here. This is the first time. So what is that telling us? That tells us that the broader market, even on a more detailed version, which is what this is, diving into the industry groups, money, uh, the money's not sticky. The money, we have some giant changes. You know, this uh, REIT dropped 21, uh, 21 points uh, in its score from last week. We had a 28 point move up in retail, a 36 point move in regional banks. Um, there's a lot of shuffling going on. There's a lot of indecision going on. And this table really highlights the fact that we, uh, managers, uh, money, where people are really voting with their dollars, there's no real conviction in the broader market. Uh, uh, the last thing that we're going to show here is just a little bit of um, how the SEEF model has done year to date and then how it's done historically. I'm gonna pass it off. Yeah, I thought it was a good idea just to put things into perspective. Um, CIF is moving around, and um, I think people get uneasy because they're maybe feeling the model isn't acting properly or whatever it might be. The model's doing exactly what we want it to do. We don't want forecasting. You can get forecasting for free on CNBC. We want data showing us where people are voting with their wallets. But just to bring it into perspective here, this is something that we update every week at the end of the week just to see how our models are doing. We're gonna focus on the extreme right side here. We've got, so the upper half of this um, is gonna be year to date, showing uh, CIF right here along with the S&P. So CIF is orange, S&P is yellow. For the year, um, CIF is trailing the S&P by 5.2%, uh, let's call it 16 versus 21. It's trailing by about 5%. This is updated weekly for us. Three weeks ago, it was dead even with the S&P 500. Look at the difference though, the drawdown, only 5.7% for CIF, 8.5% for SPY. Um, beta, 
is almost half, which again is showing you the volatility within the model versus the volatility within the index. Standard deviation 960 instead of 1210. So this is going to move around from week to week. And if the market is indecisive as to where to put the money and keep it, it's going to jump a little bit. But this is, to me, this is what's important. I'm not a day trader. We're not doing day trading here. We want to make money over time with low drawdowns. And that's what this does. This is historically since inception, summertime of 2018, 12.73 annu annualized for the S&P, 20.6 annualized for SEEF. So SEEF is outperforming almost by 8% a year annualized since the middle of 2018. Um, maximum drawdown, a little bit less for CIF at 29.4 versus 33.9 for the S&P. Beta, 0.85, a little bit less than the S&P. And look at the sharp ratio, it's 108. Anything over a 1.0 in sharp is a solid. Sharp is showing the amount of risk. Um, explain sharp quickly. Yeah, so sharp... All Sharp is is just understanding of how much return you're getting outside of the risk-free rate, which would in this case would be the equivalent of a, a treasury note, um, and then divided by the amount of risk. So it's the return you're getting above the risk-free rate by the units of risk that you're taking. So uh, it just really tells you, um, based on the risk, how much return are you getting. Anything over one is pretty rock solid. I mean, I was looking at a lot of ETFs that are like SEEF, that are managed ETFs, are not just tracking an index. I didn't see one that was over 1%. So just wanted to have a little reality check and try to remind everyone of what we're trying to do here. And um, hopefully that gives you a little bit better understanding how the models work, what we're looking for, why we think this is happening, and how we are doing um, for the year and for the past six or seven years. That is all we have for this week. We look forward to breaking down the Seath model with you all next week. And thank you.